um, which is a registered investment advi um, advisor that provides professional money management and financial planning services for individual investors and businesses. Um, our speaker today is Rick Bloom. Um, I'm sure you can introduce, but he has um, served clients in the financial planning um, since 1984 and is a partner with Clint Ken Bloom in Bloom Asset Management and the law firm of Bloom, Bloom & Associates. He has been named one of the top financial advisors in the United States for 2019 by Barron's Magazine and is also an executive in residence at Lawrence Tech University. He serves as a host for the popular Rick Bloom Show on WDTKAM 1400 and was a host of the Money Talk radio show on WXYT 1270 AM for 16 years. Um, he's also a, day, a daily financial columnist for the Detroit News for over 10 years and wrote twice weekly financial columns for the Oakland Press. Could we please give a warm welcome to Rick? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm pretty laid back, pretty carefree as I go along, pretty casual. So if you have questions, feel free to shoot them out at any time. And I always tell people, there's no such thing as a dumb question. There's dumb answers, but no dumb questions. And for those of you who don't like to ask questions in front of a group, with me is uh, Jack Riashi, Wayne State graduate. Um, that uh, Jack sits on our investment committee, so he can also uh, take questions. And particularly if they're hard ones, <coughs> just go right to the back. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk today about retirement, <coughs> and I can't tell you, it's, it's such an important topic for everyone in this room. I don't care if you just started your first day of work today and retirement is 40 some odd years down the road, or if you're already retired, it's an important topic. Now think about this. We live in the greatest, richest country in the history of the world. Half the people in this country are retiring at the poverty level. 70% of Americans, if they miss a paycheck, one paycheck, they can't afford to pay their bills. You know, in the old days, people had pensions and, you know, that covered things. It's not the way it is anymore for the great majority of people. We have to take care of our affairs. And think about this with retirement. I always tell people, Retirement's a brand new concept in the history of mankind. This isn't something that past generations had to worry about. I mean, go back a little over 100 years ago, the last turn of the century. What do you think people did in the early 1900s? They went home on Friday and they died. <laughs> I mean, they didn't worry about retirement. And even think about in the 30s and the 40s when, you know, Social Security kicked in. You know, you know why they picked 65 years of age at first for Social Security? Exactly. People were, they didn't think people would live that long. Yeah, we'll give them a pension when they get old. And, and now we look at 65 as round two. I mean, when I first got involved in this business, I don't want to tell you how long ago that was, but they used to tell you, look at, if you get someone five or ten years into retirement, that's all you need. Because when someone's in their 70s, what do they need money for? They're too old. Well, today, you know, if someone passes in their 70s, we say, oh my God, they were so young. So, you know, and today, you know, I compare the retirement that exists today to like my grandparents. Now, my, my grandfather worked at the foundry at Ford, which is a very tough physical job. And when he retired, he got ready to die. Well, today when someone retires, by the way, has anyone been on a cruise? You can't go on a cruise with half the people, they're over 70 years of age. I mean, it has been a, a dramatic change in our society. And for many young people in the room, you're going to be retired for as many years as you work. I got to tell you this, there's nothing worse in this country than to be old and poor. And so by getting involved with your retirement today, no matter what stage it is, it's going to allow you to have a comfortable retirement. And most importantly, you're not going to have to ask your kids for money. No one wants to do that. So. 
Whatever you think you know about retirement, throw it out. The old days, what they used to, when I first learned about retirement, what they said is as you get older, it costs you less and less to live. That went out with eight tracks. <laughs> I mean, think about it. My grandparents, my grandparents had a phone. It was the rotary phone. And for those of you who are young, you don't know what it is. But that was their phone. Whether it was 10, 20, 30 years old, that was their phone. They ain't getting a new phone. Well, today, you know, we carry these stupid little things around. And whatever phone we have today, we know five years, six years, seven years from now, it's obsolete. Yeah, six months. It kills me. I bought a new refrigerator not too long ago. And so, um, you know, I go to ABC to buy it, and I asked the sale, I don't want to get the latest, greatest, you know, I don't need that. So I said, well, how long should this last? You know, I'm thinking at least 20 years, you know, 20, 25. He looks at me and says, well, you know, you can get five to seven years out of this refrigerator. It's crazy. But the reality, that's what exists today. I mean, go back 30 years ago. And for those of you who are around, you remember we used to get these things in the paper, AOL discs. Remember those 30 free hours or 50 free hours? <laughs> you know, and today we have major bills for internet. So in the old days when they taught you you could live on a shrinking income the rest of your life, that was true. But today you have to have a rising income. There's no one in this room who believes that 10 years now won't cost them more to live than it does today. And so then when you think you could be 30 years in retirement, think about how much things have changed over the last 30 years and compare that to when you're retired. So it's important that we all get involved with it and that we all you know, look at retirement as a major concern. Now I believe that Especially, you know, with retirement, the key is not picking the right stocks, the right investments, it's timing the market. In other words, time in the market is much more important than trying to time the market. So people say, yeah, but the market's at its all-time high now. You know, I can't invest. Sure you can, and you should. But it's important that we learn to invest the right way. So I want to talk about some few concepts. First of all, how you should all invest your 401ks, 403bs, is not based upon your age. That's what Wall Street always tells people. You invest based upon your age. Well, to me, age is immaterial. What does age say about you? Yeah, but Rick, I'm 70 years old and I don't want to lose money. I've never met the 20-year-old who wants to lose money. You invest based upon your goals and objectives. Think about it. Let's say that I said, you know, because you guys came today, the union is going to give you all a free paid vacation. Go home and pack. We're all going on a free all expense paid vacation. We know that's not true. <laughs> but if it was, what would you ask me? Where are we going? Now, why would you want to know where we're going? So you know how to pack. If we were going to Alaska tomorrow, we would dress differently than if we are going to Florida tomorrow. <coughs> so it's sort of, you know, I mean, it's your gold. If I was going to Florida, I would take my golf clubs. Even though I'm just pathetic at the game, and I describe my game as I get more strokes per dollar than most people. But I wouldn't take my golf clubs if I'm going to Alaska. Goals and objectives. Planning your portfolio is like planning a vacation. You have to know where you're going. And where you're going really is a time frame. So I have someone I deal with, 90 years old, and who's been dying, according to him, since he's been 70. Oh, well, today's my last day. <laughs> All his money is invested long term. Wait a minute, Rick, that makes no sense. You said he's getting ready to die, and you have all his money invested long term. That makes no sense. 
Well, it does make sense if you talk to him and you find out what his goals are for his money. His goal is to pay for all his grandkids' college so they don't have any debt when they graduate. And so his grandkids are young, so we invest based upon that, not based upon his age. So you have to get away from thinking age is important. It's not. It's what you're trying to achieve. First question you ask yourself when you invest money is, what am I looking for from this money? If I'm saving for retirement, it's 20 years down the road. It's a different investment than if I'm saving for a vacation in six months. The second thing you have to understand is risk. Can anyone tell me what they would consider a risk-free investment? Anyone? You know, someone's dying, they say, Rick, CDs, they're risk-free. Let me tell you, there is no such thing as a risk-free investment. It does not exist. And I'm not saying if you buy a U.S. Treasury, the government's going to default. That'll never happen. <coughs> if you buy a CD and you put your money in and it matures, you're going to get your money back. Period. Well, wait, Rick, you said that there's risk with those. There are. <laughs> and it's a risk that most people don't take into consideration, but for most people, it's the greatest risk they have. And what that is, is increased cost of living. So you put your money into a CD, and you say, you know, and I'm leaving it there for 20 years. Well, no time in history for any 10, 15, 20 year period has CDs ever made money when you take into consideration inflation, increased cost of living, and taxes. So you get your 2% on a CD, you're losing a third of that in taxes, you're not even keeping up with, the, with your increased cost of living. So is that, isn't that a risky investment? It guarantees down the road. Now, there are people in this room today, I guarantee you, that are driving a car more expensive than their first house. I grew up in Oak Park as a kid. My parents paid $13,000 for their house. I'd venture to say, you can't really buy a car today for $13,000. So, Always understand every investment has a risk. The stock market. When I ask this in a lot of speeches, I say, is the stock market risky? Is it aggressive or not? And everyone, oh yeah, it's always aggressive. And I say, really? I said, no time in history has the stock market ever lost money forever for any 15 year period in history. Only one 10 year period in history, it actually lost a little. So you'd sit there going, wait a minute, that doesn't seem as an aggressive investment. You know why people think the stock market's aggressive? They look at it every day. I mean, think about that. I know people that go home every day and check how their 401k plan did. It sort of reminds me when I was a kid, I'd come home from school, my mom say, what'd you learn today? Nothing, mom. You know? I mean, would we tell a kid who's going to wane Let's judge your education on one day, or one week, or one month, or even one year. No. We it's a much longer thing. So risk is a function of time. Stock market is not aggressive if you're looking 10, 15 years down the road. CDs are extremely aggressive if you're looking 10, 15 years down the road because they never made money. <coughs> If I was looking six months down the road, stock market's very aggressive. If I'm looking 15 years, it's not. So you have to understand that when it comes to investing. Some people say, well, I'm a conservative investor, so they automatically invest their money in CDs and U.S. Treasuries. That's not conservative when you invest in something that's guaranteed to lose money over time. So it's important that you understand those concepts of investing. You invest based upon your goals and objectives, and you always look at what risk that investment has. And anyone who tells you, and it's almost always going to be a sales person, this investment has no risk, you ought to run. Because every investment has risk, and you need to identify risks 
so that you're comfortable with them and you understand it. I don't care what happens in the stock market today. It's immaterial for most people. You know, you know, so it drops 100 points, increases to, it's, it's immaterial. You have to take a longer term approach with the stock market. Now, one other thing about investing that throws investors off is fear and greed. Investors that let fear and greed enter their investment decision almost always make the wrong decision. Oh my God, you know, something happens and people say, I got to get out of the market. Oh my God, you know, the coronavirus, it's going to, you know, the markets are going to collapse the whole bit. They said that on CNBC, I heard it. So people rush out. Well, you know, since the coronavirus, U.S. stock markets hit record highs. That may not make sense, but the market doesn't make sense over the short run. I mean, think about, you know, you invested money right during the financial crisis. 11 years ago today, 2009, we're in the midst of the financial crisis, and you invested money in the, in the stock market. And people said, you, you got to be nuts. And you said, no, oh, I'm looking long term. So here it's 11 years. Back 11 years ago, the Dow was at around 7,000. What's it today? About 29,000. That was a hell of a run over the last 11 years. And it's not like things have been so good around the world. So don't let fear and greed dictate your investment decisions. You have to, you know, separate those. You know, when someone says to me, you know, should I invest in, you know, GM or Ford? And, you know, I'm from this area. I have an affection for those companies. I want them to do well. But when it comes to investing, that means nothing to me. I look at it purely from an investment decision. I have this philosophy. My investments don't love me. I don't love them. You know, a perfect example is GM. When GM went into bankruptcy a few years ago, how'd they treat their shareholders? <coughs> Who said that? 100% right. They, they, you know, they didn't even get a seat at the table. Well, that's what they think of their investors. We should have no loyalty when it comes to our investments. You should have loyalty to achieving your financial goals. That's what you have loyalty to. Now, the other thing that throws investors off is taxes. Oh my God. Just curious, how many people have as one of their financial goals to lower their taxes? To lower your taxes. Right? What's that? Well, so, I'm just going to pick on someone. Can I pick on you? Yeah, so you said you want to lower your taxes. I'm going to prove to her you that she does not want to lower her taxes. And I want to prove to you that no one wants to lower their taxes. First of all, let me tell you this. There's no one in this room that understands our tax laws in its entirety. I read something on taxes a good two, three hundred days a year to stay current, and I can't stay current. The IRS, by the way, does anyone work for the IRS here? Okay. The IRS is the only organization I know of that sends out a press release saying, we're only giving the wrong answer out 50% of the time now. But the reason I say you want to lower your taxes, and I'll prove it, would you want to explain to me why you wouldn't want to win the $500 million lottery? Right? I mean, anyone who wants to lower their taxes wouldn't want to win the $500 million lottery. This is going to cost them $100 million in taxes. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take that lottery ticket from you. I won't charge you for it. I'll just take it. You know? Anyone who wants to lower their taxes, they should go to the union rep that was here earlier and say, no, 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 please cut our pay. Cut our pay so we pay less in taxes. We don't want to do that. We, you know, every one of us would love <coughs> to pay Bill Gates' tax bill if we could have his balance sheet. It's not about taxes. I can lower anyone's taxes. It's easy. Lose money. 
<laughs> what you should focus on is the most important number, and that is what ends up in your pocket. So when anyone tells me, I get this all the time, Rick, we can lower taxes. Run! That's not your goal. Your goal is to have more money in your pocket so you can do the things that you want to do. If you focus on taxes, you're focusing on the wrong thing. And that's a lot of what Wall Street wants you to do. They want you to focus on taxes because they can pull all this stuff on you. You go back about 20 years ago, we had something called limited partnerships. They were selling like hotcakes. You know, they sold over $100 billion of them because they lowered your taxes. And they worked. They lowered their taxes. And of the $100 you know, billion dollars of limited partnerships, about $99 billion went poof. They all lost money. But people, yeah, but they lowered your taxes. Makes no sense. So don't do anything for tax reasons and tax reasons alone. Do things that make good economic sense. I get this all the time. Well, Rick, I got to you know, pay taxes. Well, congratulations. You know, that's our system. The more money you make, the more you pay in taxes. That's just the way it goes. Always focus on what ends up in your pocket. You won't get scammed. Now, we talk about retirement. Everyone should be aware of their number. You know, if I ask people what their cholesterol is, they tell you this or that. No one, and, and the number that you need to focus on what's important is what it costs you to live a month. I mean, think about it. It is the most important number, particularly if you deter, say to yourself, can I afford to retire? Well, when people ask me, can I afford to retire, I, I don't know. What does it cost you to live a month? And they said, well, I, I don't know. Well, how can I make that determination? I mean, if you're Bill Gates, and it costs you $10 million a month to live, it's a little different than if you're Joe Blow and it costs you, you know, $5,000 a month. So what everyone in this room should do is know what it costs you to live a month. Not what you can exist on, but what it actually costs you to live. It's an important number because as you get closer to retirement, you're going to have to determine, can I afford to retire? And it's not saying to yourself, I can afford to retire. It's, can I afford to retire and be staying in retirement for 30 years? So what I generally look at is the first thing I want to do is look at what it costs me to live a month. And again, I'm including everything. If I buy the grandkids, uh, you know, holiday presents and Christmas gifts and birthday, that's part of my expenses. If I take vacations, that's part of my expenses. So I come up with a number. That's what, you know, it costs me to live per month. So I annualize that number. Now, for those of you who are 50 and over, you're going to get Social Security. So, let's say it costs you making up a number, it costs you $50,000 a year to live, you're going to get $20,000 a year in Social Security, you know you've got this $30,000 a year shortfall. And this is going to sound like a big number, because it is. If you retire at normal retirement age, mid-60s, that shortfall, you want that yearly shortfall. You want 25 to 30 times that number. It's a lot of money. I mean, so if you said to yourself, if your shortfall was, you know, thirty thousand dollars a year, and you need 25, you know, to 30 times that number, we're talking about a million and a half dollars. But that's the reality of the situation. That that's the number that you can have a comfort zone. And unfortunately, when it comes to retirement, it's not a calculation you do once and forget about it. For those of you in retirement, you need to look at these numbers every year. You need to relook at what does it cost you to live. Because if your expenses are going up, as they will, you may have to make adjustments. Or you may have to say, okay, maybe I'll get a part-time job or I'll do something. 
But the problem is, is that what a lot of Americans do, they don't, they ignore it and they say, eh, you know, I'll worry about it down the road. All of a sudden they're 75 or 80, they're running out of money and they don't have a lot of options. That's why you got to look at throughout your career what it costs you and always control your expenses. It's much easier to control your expenses than it is to control your income. Sometimes we can't control our income, but we can make adjustments on our expenses. And if you focus on your expenses, you are going to be successful as an investor. So, for those of you who are just starting your careers, you know, how do you start saving for retirement? Well, I think the best way is through your 401ks, 403bs, salary deferral programs. They're easy. And how much you should be saving? I tell someone when they start their career, the minimum they have to save for their retirement is 10% of their gross. It's a huge number. But it's easier to make adjustments when you're younger as opposed to when you're older. Why does you need to save that much money? Is because think about for the younger people. For just about every year you work, you're going to be retired. So you have to have those resources. And as time goes on, there's a lot of people today that will tell you you should save 15% when you're younger. And, if, and the more you can save, the better it is. Because what you have to keep in mind is that for most of us, pensions are a thing of the past. They're not coming back. So the only fixed income you're going to have coming in is Social Security. And particularly for those of you under 50, it's hard to know what's going to happen with Social Security. <clears throat> I know what someone's going to say, yeah, but Rep, I paid in and that's not fair. Okay. <clears throat> it's not fair. <laughs> you know, but it is what it is. You know, that Social Security, you'll probably receive something, but it'll be a fraction of what you think you'll receive. And so it's important that every year you really, and I think most people should do it twice a year, but at least once a year, go through all your expenses and see what it costs you to live. And one way to know if you're in the ballpark is, if your take home is, I mean, it's up $3,000 a month, and you say it costs you $2,000 a month to live, you should say to yourself, well, I'm saving $1,000 a month. Great. Where's that $12,000? I get that all the time with people. I'll sit down, and this is what it is, and I look at their take home. I say, so where's the money? They go, well, it just goes. No, it doesn't. You spend it. And you have to know how you spend your money. You know, and, and, and I'll tell you this. Now, my friends call me cheap. <coughs> it is true. I, I love coupons, you know, and I love on sale. There's, there's something about those things. But you should be cheap with your money too. You know, you need to look at fees and costs because, you know, nowadays people just throw on fees and people pay them automatically. I got a... a something on my phone bill. No, I'm sorry, it was the cable bill. And it was one of these, you know, one-time expenses. You know, it was like 20 bucks or something. I called. I swear, I can't tell you how much they hated me. So I said to them, I want to know what this expense is. And I went from Tweedledee to Tweedledum. And after getting to the right person, they say, well, you know, sir, it's a voluntary expense. Hmm. It's a voluntary fee. So it doesn't say that in my bill. Well, we can take it off if you don't want. Yeah, take it off. <laughs> you know, people pay fees all the time, and they do it because they, first of all, they don't want to appear cheap. Trust me, it's no big deal appearing cheap. <laughs> <laughs> but it's your money. And, and you know what? It's one thing corporate America has realized. You know, all they need to do is put little fees in and people pay them automatically. Don't do it. Start contesting those things. Now, I believe it's important to understand investing. And I want to run through with you some of the rules I live by when it comes to investing your money. 
Because you have to get involved and you have to learn about investing. The more you learn, the better investor you will be. Does anyone ever watch on CNBC American Greed? Yeah, I mean, isn't it amazing to you? You see some really smart people, they fall for the dumbest scams. Well, the more you know, the less you'll fall for the scams. I mean, think about the Bernie Madoff scam. $65 billion. And if you look at the list of people, they're very wealthy people. And of course, everyone thinks if you're wealthy, you're smart. You're not. It just means that you can make more dumb mistakes and not cost you than other people. But you, you look at the, the Bernie Madoff, you sit there going, how could people be so stupid? It's because you get caught up in a frenzy. So I want to run through some rules that I live by that hopefully will protect your money. One, I don't invest in anything that I can't check out independently. If I can't check out an investment independently, I'm walking away from it. You know, I, I mean, someone says, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Great. I'm going to believe them. I want to check it out independently. If I can't check out an investment independently, I'm walking away from it. Period. Two, I don't invest in anything that doesn't have a track record. You know, may not be totally cor correct to say, the reason we invest money is to make money. So I want to see how an investment is done. You get this, especially in today's world, yeah, but this is the newest and greatest thing. That's what they said about laser discs. They lasted about 10 minutes. I want to see something that has done well during good times and bad times. You know, I always analogize, I grew up uh, as a Tiger fan. And when I grew up, the best player in our team was Al Kaelin. You know, and it's not that Al Kaelin had, you know, was the best player year after year. He had a great career. So we always had some kid that would come up and he'd be doing great, you know, at the beginning of the year. And then by Memorial Day, he's back in Toledo. You know, I want the Al Kaelin's on my team that year after year perform and have a good solid track record. So I <coughs> want to check out track records. What I generally look at is three, five, and ten year track records. Yeah, but Rick, this investment is brand new. It doesn't have a long-term track record. I'm not putting my retirement money in there. That's a gamble. Get another one gambling. You want to gamble? Great. I don't want to gamble with my retirement money. When I gamble, I assume if I put $10 down on the blackjack table, I've lost <coughs> it immediately. I'm not doing that with my retirement money. So if you want to take a flyer on something, great. But that's not an investment. Three, I always like to tell people I'm not the brightest guy in the world. I hope I'm not the dumbest. I don't invest in anything I don't understand. I mean, my God. You know, sometimes you get these thick things with these investments. Try to read it. They're not written in English. They're written by some godly goop lawyers that don't want you to understand it. I want to understand investment. When I say understand, I want to know how I can make money, how I can lose money, how I can get my money out when I want. If I don't know those three things about an investment, I'm walking away from it. Bernie Madoff, who was, I mean, we all know he's sleaze, but he was a genius. You know what one of his sales pitches was? If someone asked him a question about his investments, he'd say, you know, you're really not a candidate because, you know, you're really not that smart, you know, if you don't understand this. So he made people feel guilty, and then they would rush in there. I admit I don't know things. And when I don't know things, I'm not going into them. So I think you should do the same thing. Make sure you understand what you're getting involved in. I had someone in the office not too long ago, and they bought this annuity investment. The man's 80 years old, so I, I'm looking at it, and I says, you know, you locked your money up for 15 years. He, was, he didn't realize he locked it up. He was, they never told me that. Well, salesmen aren't going to tell you that. You need to check these things out independently. Four, as I told you earlier, 
I'm a little tight with a mark. I'm not embarrassed by that. You know, you should be tight too. You know, when it comes to investing, you ought to know what investment costs you to buy, what it costs you to sell, and what it costs you to hold. My God, people are getting ripped off galore on investments because they don't know about it. You know, I, I, getting back to the annuity, I told the guy, I said, by the way, do you know how much commission the guy made on it? He goes, no, he didn't say anything. I said, well, he invested 100 grand on this investment. He made 10 grand. I thought the guy was going to flip out right down and there. He said, what? I go, yeah, that's what his commission was. You ought to know what things cost you. And you know when they don't want to tell you, you know it's too much. I always believe in commission-free investing. Why pay someone when you don't have to? But you ought to know the cost of every investment. And sometimes you'd be surprised how much you save by moving investments into things that have a lot less cost. Costs do matter. My last rule is, you know, you got to know my size. you got to have a smell test. Something smells too good to be true it is. I really want to believe. I really do. That you can take this pill, never exercise, eat whatever you want, whenever you want, in endless quantities, and never put weight on it. I want to believe it. I know it's not true. Just like I know it's not true when you see the commercial that uh, selling some of these real estate deals and the guy gets up there and he says, you know, I was broke, I had no money, and then I went to this real estate class and now, and he shows in the boat with the girls in the bikinis and he, I mean, he's flying all around. I, I want to believe that. It ain't true. We have to be reasonable. You know, I, I, I saw something the other day that uh, someone lost money on an investment. It was a Bitcoin thing. And he was told that you get a 7% return per week. And that didn't raise a red flag? It does. Don't let greed dictate, you know, be reasonable when it comes to investing. And if you do that, you're going to be successful in the fact you're going to avoid the scams. I'd much rather take a hit on the high end, not get hit on the low end, which means I don't want to lose my money. So yeah, maybe I'm going to miss out on the next Google sometimes, but for every Google, there's 10,000 other investments that people have lost big time. You need to set your rules for your investments, and you may make adjustments to those are rules I live by. When it comes to investing, what you need to do is, and the reason why most people fail, by the way, when it comes to investing, this will sound strange, because they focus on their investments. Wait a minute, did he say that right? People fail their investments? Yeah, because they focus on their investments. That's not where the focus should be. Your focus should be on your game plan. You know, don't focus on, you know, what Apple did today. Make sure you have the right game plan. If you have the right game plan, you will be successful. It's much more important than the investments. And so when I say the right game plan, before you invest, you ought to know how much money you're putting in stocks, how much in cash, and how much in bonds. You need to do that allocation beforehand. And, and that's how you are successful. So in other words, Let's say I say, you know, you're a long-term investor. I know you just have a few minutes, so I just want to make this real fast. You make you 70% in stocks and 30% in bonds. And then, you know, stocks did great. And now they represent 80% of your portfolio. You know what you do? You sell some. You sell winners, you buy losers. Buy low, sell high. That's the exact opposite most people do. Most people sell their losers and they buy winners. So they sell low, they buy high. It's not a prescription for success. So I know I just have a few minutes left. I want to make sure I leave time to open it up for any questions that you may have regarding you know, your money and things of that nature. And I want to assure you, following your money and being involved 
is the only hobby I know of that you can actually make money as opposed to costing you money. And you don't have to be a genius to, to get involved with it. The key is, again, don't focus on your investments, focus on your overall game plan. If you have the right game plan for yourself, you're going to be successful. Any uh, questions? Russ, I believe we have like how many months we have for um, if we, I do want to introduce Clay Walker first, um, and then we will open the floor to questions. If we can have the rest of the time yeah. for questions, okay? So I just want to get Clay Walker first, okay? Just one question. Because unfortunately, there are the Madoffs out there, and uh, in fact, last year there were 60 cases of Ponzi schemes, and so um, and some of the you know. The crooks or advisors, they wear suits and ties, and they look good. And they, so I, I think you have to be still involved in the process. And I recognize a lot of people don't like it. But at a minimum, you know, one thing that you should do, you get a statement, you need to check it for accuracy. So if you see that your beginning balance didn't match the ending balance of the previous statement, you got a problem. If You know, like there was a, a case not too long ago where... Uh, and this went on for a few years. The, uh, the guy was taking money, uh, or the boss was taking money out of people's pay for their 401k. He just never deposited it in their account. And people never found it. They did. It was because an employee died that someone found it out. But no one looked at the statements. And so I think you still have to be involved. And, and, and you want to ask questions, you know, just to make sure that you know, they're still doing the job for you. And, you know, again, it's like everything else. As adults, we have adult responsibility. You have to be involved in the process somewhat. And that being said, I even tell, you know, our clients, and we manage, uh, you know, clients' money. And, you know, I'm happy when they're involved and they ask me questions so I can do a better job for them. And that's what it's about. It's important to understand when you use a financial advisor, you should also find out how they're charging you. You know, um, I don't buy a can of tuna at the store unless I know what it costs me. So when you deal with a professional, you should know how they're charging you. Um, you know, some advisors work on commissions, which I'm not a real big fan of. So you, it's a fair question to find out. And the generally, the type of advisor I recommend for most people is a fee-only advisor. Let them charge you a fee for their services. That there shouldn't be things like commissions and hidden fees. I always tell people, like at my firm, no one gets a free vacation. They pay for their own vacations. So if you're dealing with a salesperson, they're selling you products because they're getting these sales incentives. You know, it's like I don't want my doctor getting money from the drug companies to recommend this medication to me. So I think that you have to be involved. And then, let me just add one other thing, you know, about the stock market today. You know, people say, my God, when is the, the you know, we're going to have a crash. Well, of course we are. I mean, it goes without saying we're going to have one. The question is, what does that mean for you and I? Mostly nothing. Crashes are normal. Downturns in, in markets are normal. You know, it, it's sort of like I went to, uh, you know, law school. And I, does anyone ever remember a movie called The Paper Chase? Yeah, you know, so they drill you in law school. And there were days walking out of class, I'd sit there going, am I an idiot? You know, I just got totally humiliated. Well, I don't want to judge my law school career on one day. You shouldn't do the same thing with your investments. Uh, and, you know, so when you look at the market, we're going to have downturns. It's natural. They happen all the time. That doesn't mean you should do anything. Take a longer term approach. I get more concerned, and Jack will tell you this, we get more concerned when we don't have downturns. So don't focus on where, you know, all this chitter chatter on CNBC about uh, the market. Oh, let me predict the next recession. You know, one of the recessions a number of years ago, we were out of the recession before they told us we were in the recession. So don't get caught up with uh, you know, where the market is. Oh my God, it's record highs. 
you know, you're looking long term, today's a great day to invest. Yeah? Is there, you know how you were talking about, like, whatever your shortfall is, like, multiply times 25? 25 to 30, right. That's as you get, like, normal retirement age, like, you know, mid-60s. Right. So with all that kind of, uh, is there anything, like, with medical, like, um, I know there's so much uncertainty with medical insurance and all the politicians, you know, they have different ideas. But is there any, like, rule of thumb about, like, if you look at your your medical expenses now, like, you can kind of say... Unfortunately, no. But you know, that's like for why the future to kind of help you, guide you? It, that's where, that's really difficult. But that's why... You know, I want 25 to 30 times. I'm building that into my number. That includes your medical? Yeah. And I'm also constantly looking at where my expenses are so I know what that number is. I mean, the problem is, like, if you would have said, I don't know, 10, well, maybe like 12 years ago, that I'd be walking around with a phone in my wall pocket that does internet and takes pictures, I, no way. Now it's you know normal, so we don't know what new things are going to come up. But that's why, in in building that twenty five to thirty times, I'm putting a cushion in for those unexpected expenses. I have no idea what's going to happen with uh, medical. My view: we're not going to have you know Medicare for all. We're going to have to pay for our you know a good portion of our medical. And we, that's what we want to save. Um, it's uh, medical is a tough one. Do you know what's funny? I when I started my I career, wonder about that. Yeah, it, when I started my career, medical expenses were not looked at as, a, as an issue that you deal with. You're going to be on Medicare. What's the big deal? Well, we all know today that Medicare doesn't cover a lot of things, and people have to, uh, you know, supplement it themselves. Mm -hmm. But that's why I want you to have a nice nest egg they so you can do it. those things. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. So. I've been in my retirement plan, I don't know, two years or something. Congratulations. Been in Thank you. Um, so when I started, I didn't know much about it. I said, okay, I'm young. I'll do a moderate risk. I have honestly not done anything with it since I started. Okay. Well, um, I'll be done on it. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> so you really haven't. Um, but so I know the market's at a high right now. Would it be to my advantage to move to a high risk now or wait till things turned down so that I'm well, dying low. You know what's funny? You know, when we had people that uh, got out during the last recession, mm -hmm. the majority of those people are still out of the market. They're waiting for the right time. Right. You know, for you, even if I thought a crash was going to happen in the next few weeks, I'd still say, no, now's the time to do it. Because as you, you're not looking today, you're really looking 20 years down the road. And I can almost guarantee you, 20 years down the road, the market's going to be much higher. So I think that when you have a portfolio that matches your goals and objectives and your risk tolerance, that's more important. So yeah, we're going to have some downturns in the market, but you know most downturns, they're fast and they recoup. I mean, the one thing we have to recognize, the U.S. economy is unique around the world. I mean, it really, really is. I mean, the rest of the world right now is slowing down, not our economy. Our economies continue to grow, and that's... I always say that the great strength of our economy is small business. Small business drives the American. People think, oh, it's the Amazons. And it's the, no, it's not. It's the small business that has always made the American economy unique. So I, I tell you, now is a great time to restructure your portfolio, to put it in a position that you're comfortable with, and let it go. Yeah, I mean, at the time when I started, I was like, well, I'm young. I can at least do moderate risk. I'm a conservative person, so, like, high risk just scared me. And so I was like, but, well, you know. But don't equate risk, you know, political thoughts right. and, you know, I mean, no. I mean, what I always say, the difference between a conservative investor and an aggressive investor, the conservative investor gets nervous when the markets are retreating. The aggressive investor doesn't worry about it. Right, like, I've been for years thinking, market can be low because the lower it is the more I get, right? Because I'm buying more shares. So like I've had that perspective. Well which is true. But that's a great attitude because when the market drops, you keep putting money in, you're buying more shares so it takes you less to recoup. That's a great strategy. But you know, I, I always believe that 
You know, people somehow think it's important what the Dow is doing today. It's totally immaterial. It doesn't mean a thing. Because we're not investing for today, we're investing 10 and 20 years down the road. And that's what we need to focus on. You know, it's, a, it's also important for her to coordinate. You know, if you have other accounts, if you have a Roth, or you have a, a taxable account, or something outside of a retirement account, you should mm -hmm. really be a global portfolio. And Most people tend to do that. They tend to look at each of their accounts and they invest them maybe differently. Mm -hmm. And you should really be more of a global approach. And, and GX, right, and, and, and yeah. in that regard too, if you're married, you'll coordinate with what your spouse is doing. Right. So you have a diversified portfolio without all your things. Yeah? If you're married and one person has a retirement account through a company, but the other person is kind of working part-time, is it advisable to open up like a second joint retirement account that you both dump into? You know, yeah, and uh, uh, you know, there is a lot of different options. Maybe it's just a, an IRA. And then what they have to make the decision of is a Roth IRA versus a traditional. Just like in your 401 plans, you know, Roth contribution versus a traditional. The difference is when you go into a traditional, let's say, IRA, you're putting pre-tax money in. And the money grows tax deferred. And then when you retire, the money comes out, it's taxed. On the other hand, you could do a Roth IRA. A Roth IRA, you're putting in after-tax money. You don't get a tax break. However, all the money grows tax-free. And when you withdraw it, there's no taxes. So typically, if you're a young guy, I would tell your wife, take the tax hit today, go into a, a Roth IRA, all that money grows tax-free. It gives you greater flexibility when you guys retire. You have money that you can withdraw tax-free. Yeah, well, sure. Let's say we both do a lot of 1099 work on the side. We're musicians. So every year tax time, we get hit real hard. And now the way things have changed, we owe money. Right. If we did a traditional IRA, would we reduce our yearly what we're going to owe? Yes. Okay. Potentially. So, depend, you know, some of your taxes are the self-employment tax you pay. That's a killer tax. Not much you can do about that. That is basically Social Security. You know, so let's say that uh, you were an employee somewhere. You would pay your Social Security, then your employer would match it. When you're a 1099 employee, there is no employer. You're the employee employer, so you're putting the entire, you know, contribution. I would tell you to think... You know, and again, it's always great to get tax write-offs today, but I'm also thinking years and years down the road, when you have all this money accumulated that you could take out tax-free, it gives you a great, great flexibility. So sometimes I'd rather take short-term hit today for long-term gain tomorrow. So I would tell you I would still probably do, uh, you know, like a Roth IRA and... Yeah, but he can, he can also do a 1099, but he can do a 401k. Yeah, yeah, you can do a single person 401k. 401 yeah, so it depends upon you know what you want to do, but you can get like through Fidelity and Schwab, they have some, you know uh, you know 401k single plan, so you don't have to pay anyone to do it and things of that nature. Rick, Good point. I have a, a, a question. Mm -hmm. The whole university has to. Uh, providers, TIA, Craft, um, Fidelity. Right. What would be the best way to take advantage of what we have and what we should really be looking at when we have we have these representatives coming here on campus periodically? And I guess most of us will not know right. what to ask for and what would be the best. Would, what can we expect? What, what should we demand them to provide us? Well, I think one thing you should expect and demand is to look at their the performances. Not just one year, but to look at three, five, ten years, fifteen year performances. Two, I would also want them to be able to tell me is what flexibility I have when I retire about withdrawing my money. Sometimes on some TIA craft plans, you have some restrictions about withdrawing money the whole bit. I don't want restrictions. I don't know what the future is going to bring. So I don't want an investment that has any restrictions. And some on these 401ks and 403bs, you have restrictions. Now, a lot of these restrictions were set up 
years and years ago because the thought was that, you know, people can't control their own money. Well, I think people do a better job of controlling their own money than corporations do of controlling it. So that's one thing I, I would look at performance and look at flexibility when you retire. Can I move my money out to another company if I want? In other words, um, can I move it to a, a Vanguard IRA? Um, a lot of times with some of these companies you can't. So those are things I would look at and I want to look at performance. And I also want to look at investment options because I want to be able to build a diversified portfolio within my uh, 401 or 403 b and I want to see who's giving me more investment options I can use. That being said, I would tell you, for most people, I would lean towards fidelity. I think fidelity gives you better options, uh, more diversification, and more flexibility when you retire. And you should know, no one pays me. The only ones I get money from is my clients. So I have no loyalty to Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, I have loyalty to my clients because that's who pays me. What is in general that you can expect from a financial advisor to really uh, charge you? Like well, it all depends. Um, there's all sorts of things. I can tell you, we charge based on money under management. We charge 1% of the money under management. Um, you know, others will charge you commissions. I think if you go over the 1%, uh, I think... There's a lot of firms that charge 1.5% and 2%. I think that's too expensive, personally. Um, and, uh, you know, because uh, if you're, they're charging you 2%, it's hard to make money. Yeah? Um, so my question was, um, so what if you started here many years ago and you just signed up for a target date fund of, you know, someone gave you an estimate, right. you signed up for that. So what you were saying is that age doesn't really matter. So if you're willing to be more aggressive, should you change to like a later right. target date? And you know the problem I have with these target date funds? What does it mean I'm retiring? I mean, that alone. Maybe, you know, that I have a spouse who's working, he's going to continue working. We don't need money. Or maybe I got, I'm going to work part-time. So those target funds are based upon that. When you get to be 65, you're going to start needing your money. Well, maybe you won't need it till you're 75 or 80. So I don't think they give you a lot of flexibility. So I'm not a big fan of the target date funds. Uh, because, again, I don't know, just because someone retires, I don't know, what, does life end then? No. In fact, you know, you look at a lot of surveys, people actually spend more money their first five years of retirement than when they worked. So I don't think they give you a lot of flexibility. I want more growth. Because I'll tell you this, retirement is expensive. It really is. And, you know, you worked hard your whole life to have the flexibility and freedom to do the things you want, and that's what you need resources to do. You have a package here that we were provided, all of us. What would be the advantages to really, when we come to your uh, advice? What well, you get from I think your, what, what is special that you offer? You get to listen to my jokes. <laughs> no, I, I think what we offer is one, is that, first of all, we've always been a fee-only advisory firm. We've never worked on commissions. We've always found a professional view of, of things. Two is that, I think one of our strengths is that we listen to our clients. We want to know, we don't have set portfolios. Oh, your client 10, this is your portfolio. We want to know what you're trying to achieve. We want to know your goals and objectives. We want to understand your risk so that we can build a portfolio and manage a portfolio based upon you and only you. I think too many times, again, people are put into groups based upon their age, which are immaterial. Three, I think that uh, the fact that we've been around a long time and the fact that we have a history of not falling in love with any investment. We, we don't have loyalties. You know, you can go back and look at funds and investments I recommended 30 years ago are not what I recommend today. Because we look at it, it's always what's good for our clients. And we also have the professional credentials um, that we have attorneys, CPAs, uh, CFPs on our staff. And the last thing I just think is an advantage, which most firms don't do, is we work as a team. 
And, you know, no one in our firm has assigned any one advisor. And the reason for that is we want, you know, a team approach to things. You know, if you go to certain financial offices, talk to this advisor, they'll tell you something different than this one, they'll all do things differently. We have one team, we have one approach. And uh, what we believe is in low-cost investing, because we think that money looks better in your pocket than it does anywhere else. And we know that low cost equal high returns. And that's what our goal is, to put more money in your pocket. And, and, we, uh, do, and we do coordinate, as I mentioned earlier, about four, we, we match four of the case. Yeah. For clients. So we'll incorporate that with all their other investment assets. Yeah. I have a question. Um, I know it's probably giving out more information about myself than I want to, but um, I've been here for about 25 years. Congratulations. I've been, thank you. I've been invested pretty much up to the point where I could. And with my um, retirement, um, my divorce, I did get a hit with my divorce. Um, but looking at that 750 roughly, I'm about a third of the way there. It took 25 years to get there. Is it reasonable that I could have that 30 times amount? Yeah, because if remember. In 15 you, years? Well, put it this way. Because that's it, what I got before well, retirement. But it, it, right, but in 15 years, the money you have now is at least going to double if you've invested, and maybe even more so. So if you look at yourself and say, you know, when I'm 50, you know, I have 10 to 12 times, you know, you're right in the ballpark. You really are. Okay. Yeah. And, and the key is to stay invested and to keep putting money in. Because there's a rule of 72. If you take the return you're getting, divide it into 72, it tells you how long it takes your money to double. So if you got to make this up now, if you averaged 7% uh, a year, that means every 10 years your money would double. You know, and today 7% may be a little high considering where interest rates are and, and stuff like that. So you say every 6 years, it means every 12 years your money is going to double. So you have like one and a half doubling times, you know, close to that, where you need your money. So you're right on track. Congratulations. I have a question. As we get older, um, say, for illustrative purposes, say we had a traditional IRA account, but we also had another 401k account. As we get closer to retirement, are there any disadvantages to, say, rolling <coughs> over that traditional IRA into our 401? Well, I, I, I do see a disadvantage there because you're now putting all your money in the 401. Company, the university could change your 401ks, could change the investment environment with them, so you can lose out. I'd much rather do it the other way, move my 401 into my IRA so I have greater flexibility. You know, you go to companies like Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard, you can invest commission free and have a ton of investments. So. I prefer not to roll it into the 401. I'd rather roll the 401 into the IRA. And there's one other thing. If you have a Roth IRA, it is not subject to minimum required distributions. So right now we have a new law that changed uh, uh, January. It's called the SECURE Act. So now uh, you don't take a minimum required distribution until you're 72. But you know, if you have a Roth 401k, you still take a minimum distribution. If you have a Roth IRA, you don't. So the IRA gives you greater flexibility. And I, I, I personally believe, you know, and I've seen it throughout my career, companies and organizations change their 401ks all the time. And, you know, so I think you have greater flexibility to be in an IRA. I probably have time for just one more question. Of your Anyone have? Uh, so I just want to say thank you very much for uh, having me here today. I want to encourage you to be involved with your money. Um, it may seem like a daunting task, but you know every journey starts with the first step. And you'd be surprised if nothing more you learned today. If you could keep track of your expenses, know what it costs you to live a month, and focus on that. You know, look at your expenses every, you know, twice a year. It's going to allow you to be more efficient with your money. And if you can control your expenses, 
everything else will fall into place. So good luck, and thank you very much for having me.